Hey folks, this is Rabble Rouse and Rich Bergeron. Ladies and gentlemen, the Tornado and Psychic Tom Padgett with a glowing crystal ball. All right, like and uh, we uh, we kind of shortchanged our buddy last week in the main event. Uh, I actually uh, did do the opposite cards with you know one one guy on one card, one guy on the other card, but didn't win any money. Um, I just had a couple losers on that same card, and I had Calvin on, and I didn't have an MVP slot. But oh my God, Calvin Qatar just. Absolutely, my God, demolish I, I, this dude! I mean, you know that was all eight limbs. That was the science <laughs> of Muay because he had those spinning elbows. He just had the knees. I mean, he did throw a lot of kicks, but he too. Um, yeah, I, I, the elbows. I, I think did the I most mean, I'm damage. Not, I'm not shocked that he won, but the way he did it, yeah, that total domination was unbelievable. What a tough guy! Well, it's like, tough and skilled. I obviously, Man, he's on, I obviously I taught mean, him nothing that he knows. He jumped the line. But I mean, I was telling you, Tom, it's crazy. <laughs> I don't because, remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's crazy that I started out trying to do the mixed martial arts from a boxing background, and when I was serious training, trying to get into a fight, you know, and I went up to Maine for a week before I got the shingles, I was really into the elbows. And I was boxing with my elbows. Huh. And that's what he did last night. And it's the first time I've seen anything like what I tried to do on the bag done to a person. And it made me go, fuck, man. I I blew it because I could have been the guy to debut that style. But he did it. Uh, and uh, uh, that was, it was that masterful. Was just, it, 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 was, it was a masterpiece. Just a masterpiece. And Chikadze uh, kind of paid for some of his smack talk. And uh, a lot of people were <laughs> coming after him in the moment of weakness. And uh, one of them was, uh, what was that, the Korean zombie, I think? I don't know, one of, the, one of those Korean fighters. And, uh, boy, Chikadze went right after him back, verbal sparring. So that might be the next fight to be made. Uh, but he, he got a wake-up call. Yeah. He definitely got a wake-up call. The wrestling was big, um, you know, that kind of sucked the energy out of him early, but um, some of the exchanges, uh, I mean, Calvin had to take a lot of damage to give a lot of damage, but uh, if you looked at their faces afterwards, it told, told a whole different story of the fight. <laughs> he had cuts all over his head, uh, like in weird places, you know, because of those, uh, those angles of those elbows, you know. It wasn't just that he was landing elbows with speed and power, he was doing them like straight up from the ground almost and landing them yeah like he was he, along the yeah, bridge he of the nose and and a, a, up into the forehead a, 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 yeah. uh, like, like a surgeon and a butcher combined yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, wow. unbelievable and uh chikadze i really gave a lot of credit before that fight but you know you kind of can see yes how a guy like that can get all hyped up and think he's on top of the world and then just, boop, you know, get knocked down about six pegs well, <laughs> one night. Well, here's the, here's the thing, Rich. He had no plan B. Right. Um, he, uh, you know, I, supposedly he had some kind of a ground game, but I didn't see even an attempt at a takedown. And, I mean, what's the rule? If you're getting lit up on the you get to the ground. And if you can't do that, uh, and, and it... And it it seemed like he couldn't back Calvin up. Uh, only on a few times, Calvin kind of just readjust a little bit, but then that relentless pressure just, just wore him out. And, I mean, it just seemed like there was up in the corner's dead that would have made much difference. And I think maybe he was a little overconfident. Yeah. I mean, considering the role he'd been on, well, I'll just catch a guy coming in around or two. And when that didn't happen, I mean, you... I think you've always got to have at least a plan B. Now, I know when you go to plan C, it's probably about over with. <laughs> okay. Are you trying but to plug my just, website, Tom? You know, that's planbjustice.com. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, it's like uh, he just he had no answer. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's unfortunate to see that, too, because, you know, this... 
And this guy is obviously, um, you know, going to get a bonus. And all. We did get the fight of the night bonus, I bet. Pretty sure. But, um, you know, how long is it going to take him to really physically recover from that? And mentally, too, on top of that. Like, that's just hard. It's hard to take. You know, the hit to the ego is bad enough when you've been running over people. But, just, well, uh, yeah. To I have mean, to see, mentally and, and see that face in the you mirror know, every I, day as you're recovering I from that. Face was, like, ah. Uh, yeah, that was a Halloween mask face. Yeah. Oh, God, he had some deep. I mean, just, just look. I mean, uh. And it's woo. like the fighter pay thing, it's, it's perfect timing for that. It's needed more than ever, and, and you see fights like that, and and you know this guy Jakadze is probably not thinking of the long term damage at this point. He just wants to get back in there and prove that that was a fluke. You know that's a fighter's mentality, but you know as somebody that's watched the sport for a long time, and now is seeing some of these older legends dealing with all these issues, you know I remember more and more all the studies that were done that showed that yeah you might get pugilistic dementia at a higher rate in boxing but you're going to have more concussions per capita as an MMA fighter because of the elbows and knees and all that <clears throat> um, but the, the thing that gives you pugilistic dementia is the millions of shots to the head in boxing because it's a headhunter sport uh, but in both you know these kind of fights where of course, it's going to make the UFC millions. These guys are getting appeased with a $50,000 bonus for taking years off their careers in situations like this. You know, if you think about it, this guy, was, I mean, not just beaten normally. He was beaten extraordinarily. <laughs> and I hate to laugh about it, but I mean, it's just, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, and, it. and it, it, well, it's almost, you know, toward the end, I think the, the fourth round, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, is the corner going to let him come out? And then he came out and showed some signs of life in the first minute of the fifth round, and then that made for, for another four horrible minutes. Ugh, wow. Yeah. So it was a bad one. But anyway, we'll get to the rest of that one later. Um, I wanted to uh, congratulate Tony on his boy from Philly getting another upset this week last weekend over uh, Matt Conway Avery Sparrow TKO'd him Matt Conway and, you know, and Avery's a big, a big hunter you know uh, but a very technically sound fighter and um, you know he had a little bit of a derailment a few years with legal issues but I mean I remember seeing him at a live card when he was something like 2 or 3 and out you know, in the very very beginning and I think he's something like 11 and 3 now, maybe 12 and 3. Uh, but I mean, he has a decision win over Hank Lundy, who was a uh, world title challenger. But I think he even stand in that fight. Um, so Avery Sparrow, Sparrow is a talented kid. You know, just, you know, he's someone, you know, just got to catch the right break. Uh, and I did see a post from Matt Conway before I even knew that this is what happened in the fight where he was uh, already back in the gym, but um, supposedly his doctor told him that it wasn't going to happen, like he was going to have to sit down for a real long time, and and uh, so it must have been some kind of injury on top of uh, the, the TKO. Uh, I don't know if it's an arm injury or shoulder injury, but it sounded like something like that. <clears throat> so I don't know if that's an excuse, but, uh, you know, just saying, that's that's what Matt had to say about it. But definitely was not his best night, that's for sure. Uh, and then we had uh, Joe Smith Jr., the tree guy, my fellow tree guy, getting the job done there against Steve Jaffard, Jaffard however you pronounce it. And um, that, that was kind of a weird fight. You know, Jaffard kind of seemed to be playing a role more than actually fighting. And, like, he, he would hide behind his gloves for a minute, wait for the moment, and then he would start unloading on Joe with these quick, accurate punches at times. And, and he would land a few. Uh, but then Joe just kind of said, all right, I can walk through those. And kept walking through them, walking through them, and landing the more power shots and, and digging shots to the body. 
uh, a lot of well, uppercuts. I'm, well, I'm going to say this, and, 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 I, and I guarantee, uh, if you guys hadn't had this thought already, it's going to click. It's going to click. The fight reminded me of a fight that none of us saw live. <laughs> Back in 1953-ish. <laughs> and I'm going to give you a name. You may have heard of him. Called Rocky okay. Marciano. Yeah. And it reminded me of Rocky's second fight with Paul Garza, which we talk about often on the show. Now, yes. um, Jafar, you know, he was a late substitute, um, you know, and he passed eight rounds. And, you know, so he was not expected to win this fight, you know. So he had a very good defense, a very tight defense, um, and, you know, so basically his goal was going to be to frustrate Joe Smith, maybe force him into a mistake, um, and, you know, just, you know, just get him off his game. And for the, for the first two rounds, while Joe was doing the higher work rate, he didn't seem like he was really penetrating. It reminded me, you know, when Rocky first fought Roland Lestars, and he really had a tough time with it. And basically, Lestars was just trying to be a spoiler out there, as was Jafar. Then Very what, good analogy, Tony. Very yeah, good analogy. What Rocky started doing was uh, just breaking, instead of just trying to get around the, the guard, get to the, get to the arms, get to the torso, get to the biceps, get to the forearms, the shoulders. Put your glove on flesh. And him, and that's what he did, and that's what Joe Smith started doing. You could see where he would, you know, try to. If he wasn't able to get through the guard, he just hit it. You know, he. he could, and, and I always and I say this often on the show. You could say that's not a quote unquote scoring punch, and I'm doing the Doctor Evil hand quotes right now. <laughs> that's not a score. Uh, yeah, well, you know what? Let me punch you in the arm a few times, and you tell me if it doesn't doesn't hurt. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and and like this, I think Joe Smith started doing, it. and then you could see. You know, by the seventh round, he finally broke through. He hit him with a good right hand on the chin, made his knees buckle a little bit, and you could see the writing was on the wall. Guess what? And the fur went back to... Um, he chopped the tree Kevin down. Cunningham, and he's like, my shoulder's hurting. <laughs> yeah, he chopped... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and he went back to Kevin Cunningham, and he's like, oh, my shoulder's hurt. Looking for a way out. Yeah. And and it was the like round right after that, it was, you know, he pretty much just uh, 30 seconds into it, he... And, and they threw the talon, but, you know, he had no intention of getting up. Right. And it was a fighter that was out of his element. He was kind of out of his ass. And see, Joe Smith is a fighter that, you know, he's never going to dazzle you like a Floyd Mayweather um, or somebody of, of that caliber. He's going to be that real slick, smooth, defensive, quick-handed fighter. You know, he's just going to be raw. Power, strength. I worry about him though. In a, in a match up, like the Rocky Marciano. In the match up they're to trying to make run. for him with uh, Canelo Alvarez, I worry about him. But I mean, in this kind of matchup, he comes out great. But I just worry about like uh, you know not having that time to make those adjustments and like and against Canelo, he's going to be much busier and he's going to have much more power. So Joe is going to have to have a much higher work rate earlier in the fight if he's going to have a chance. So there's going to be no adjustment period. <laughs> what do you think of um, you know, Joe Smith's previous fight? Um, and he, re Maxim um, Glauchik, he really had a hard time. I mean, he got caught and he was really out of his end. Um, but once again, he's a guy that he's always in just that, you know, tremendous condition. And... Yeah. He's so physically strong. He has a hell of a chin, that, too. He you know, when he just tries to, <laughs> he just tries to just grind him. He takes a lot of damage to give a lot yeah, of damage. Yep, I mean, it, you know, it, it's no coincidence that he, he's a blue-collar guy. He yeah. fights that right. way. He fights the way he works. What is he, an iron worker or something? I mean, that, yeah, that he's makes a tree sense. guy. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a tree literally, guy. He's literally a tree oh, guy. Oh, tree, okay. He well, yeah, there you service. go. Yeah. But I mean, it's it, it just punching the time clock, getting the job done, 
been fancy, meat and potatoes, shot in a beer, bang, bang, just keep <laughs> going. And uh, how do you not like this guy, though? How yeah. could you not be a fan of him? I mean, to me, he's just, he's fun. So we'll see what happens. I mean, and he's ready to fight. He actually said he wanted a, a rematch with uh, um, b -Wall. That'll be, uh, well, let's, let's, let's see him with uh, Pinello or Butter, uh, a, a bit of a first, see how that goes. So, a lot of crap in that weight division. Yes, sir. Yeah, it really is. I mean, they've got a, a lot of high-caliber fighters. And that's taking Canelo even out of, you know, yeah. he goes back to the exactly. middleweight. I mean, you still got, you know, um, you know, Kovalev is pretty much on the downside now. He's at, he taking him out of the equation. But you got your Beterbiev's. you got your Beevils. Um, you know, you had the boy that... Beat Kovalev a couple years ago, Alvarez. Hey, you haven't heard much about him. Under Alvarez, um, you got Joe Smith. Um, you got um, the the boy that um, Beterbiev beat uh, to, um, the nail. Um, Alexander Golovkin. Uh, you have, I mean, some really good good fighters in that. In and, and and Tony, what about our former guest from about a month ago or three weeks ago? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right now, I mean, maybe the competition hasn't been severe, but, you know, he, he seems like he was ready to move up, and uh, so let's see if he can get in the... Zerto, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, we're going to start... Yeah, because like I said, he was a super middleweight champ, and then um, and he's fighting a light heavy. When you're 42 and 0, I mean, you're there for... You're 42 yeah. and 0 for a reason. It's not like he's fought... Nobody. He's fought good, you know, championship caliber fighters the last few years. You know, I, I don't know if it's a management thing with him, so why he really hasn't got a little more publicity or you know got a couple other fights. But now's the time. I mean, it seems like you know well, he can make it interesting. I think he's he does his own promotion, Zerto Promotion. So mm -hmm. you know he's picking his own moves, and and uh, sometimes that's hard to do when you're. Well, one one man operation dealing with big right, business right. guys, <laughs> and if you're undefeated well, like well, that, you, you know nobody wants to fight you. <laughs> yeah, well, see, I, right. His problem is it, it, it's it's one of those no like we were talking about with uh, boots. It's kind of a, a big risk for the Croppers and the Spences because he's not that well known. That it's the risk reward ratio isn't there. Yeah. So it won't be for a while yet. And Another thing on the fighter front, so it's going to be uh, tough, but I just recently learned last week, uh, Marcus Davis, the Irish hand grenade, ended up um, doing a fight in a promotion, I think it was like a few months ago, last year, and still has not been paid because the promotion uh, took money from an investor who had supposed ties to terrorism. So all the money that he gave was seized. <laughs> before they can cash out. <laughs> uh, yeah, ter ter what kind of ter ridiculous. what kind of terrorism do we know? I don't know. I I just read a kind of one article about it, but uh, yeah, he's pissed. Uh, and in right, right, he should be. But I mean, it's one of those things where no other sport has those kind of parameters where that kind of shit can happen. Like nobody's gonna stiff an NFL player for for a game because his owners didn't have the money. <laughs> it's just not happening. You know, baseball team's not going to yeah, go bankrupt in the middle of the season. Uh, which, and if it does, you know, the players are still going to get paid until, um, you know, it actually takes effect. But anyway, um, yeah, it happens. And, and it's, it's happened to him here. And I only bring it up because, you know, we were talking about Crawford and... How long is it going to take for Crawford's manager to be in that situation if he's as bad as they say he is with all this international crime ring shit going on? Um, or maybe he has it covered, but I don't know. It's crazy. Crazy situation when you, uh, you have to go in business by yourself in that kind of environment. So I don't envy him one bit, but you know we'll see what he can get done. Um, we're going to start talking about Saturday's fights at an interesting place uh, and I'm going to see if you guys can guess which themed fight we're going to talk about first I only hearing the arena 
and location first. It's going to be at the Big Punch Arena in Tijuana, Mexico. So what fight do you think I'm going to talk about first? The Jesus <laughs> Fight of the Week. <laughs> Jesus is in Mexico once again. Okay, so he's <laughs> fighting Jimmy Strickland, who's undefeated. 9-0 and at Super Welterweight. Deep down on the card here. And uh, it's one of those four name situations. <laughs> when you got four names and they <laughs> come from down in the south of the border, there, one of them's usually Jesus. And this guy's first name is Jesus, so more power to him. Jesus Manuel Ramos Mata. And uh, unfortunately, he has a 6 8 and 2 record. Wow. So probably not going to have much of a chance against 9 and 0 Jimmy Strickland. But that's it's got to be our Jesus fight of the week. Four namer. It just proves my theory. <laughs> Correct. Uh, mismatch of the week might be this one. Even though, the guy, even though the guy's not really, you know, got a big losing record. Uh, it's a main event in Nicaragua here. Light flyweights. Gerardo Zapata. He's thirteen and zero fighting Byron Castellon, who is fifteen, fifteen and three. Well, he's got more experience. Look at it that way. You got more experience, kid. Yeah. You'll handle this undefeated guy. He ain't fought no one like you. And then out in Dearborn, Michigan, we got an interesting one. Hugo Centeno Jr. at middleweight is in action at 28-3-1, facing Antonio Todd, who is 12-5 there in the main event. And we got a, somebody's always got to go way down on the card after a couple... Uh, TBAs. <laughs> Still got TBAs happening Saturday. You got a problem. Uh, anyway, Quentin Randall. He's 8 0 fighting Julian Smith, who's 5 0 at uh, Welterweight there. And then the title fight here uh, from Atlantic City, New Jersey at the Borgata Hotel Casino. It's going to be on Showtime. Gary Allen Russell Jr., 31 1, fighting Mark, Mark Magseo. Who's 23 and 0 for the WBC World Featherweight title? And the co main event is uh, Super Lightweights. Subriel Matthias, who is 17 and 1, fighting Petros Ananian, who is 16, 2 and 2. And Tugsukt Nayambayar at Featherweight is 12 and 2, fighting Sakaria Lucas, who's 25 and 1. And a featherweight bout there. Some fillers on the undercard, except when you get to the super welterweights. In the first fight of the night, you got a guy you might not have heard of, Chris Rollins, who's 5 3 and 1, and then a guy you probably have heard of, his father. We well, might not have heard of him, Evan Holyfield. Not a vendor, just Evan. I took the dirt off. <laughs> and, uh, well, this could be our. Competition for mismatch of the week as well. Also got 15 losses, but only five wins to go with five draws as well. Josh Ross down in Texas on Saturday will be fighting Juan Antonio Lopez in the main event, who's 16 and nine. Not, not a dominant, dominant record, but way better than five, 15 and five. And it continues to be a little bit of a slow week weekend for boxing. Usually there's more big name events. Uh, you know, I was, I was surprised. I didn't know, um, you know, they were at the Borgata in Atlantic City. I don't know if they had any cards there before. Um, like Atlantic City boxing the last few years has really, really been. I mean, you can't, it's hard to say because you know you did have the you know, the pandemic that's been you know shadowing things for the last two years. But even before that, the last play card I went to in Atlantic. Sergey Kovalev when he got knocked out back in 2018, and prior to that, I think my last card before that might have been um, um, Miguel Cotto and Alfonso Gomez in like 2008. So it's like you know you could look at like back in the day, have at least a fight or two a month down Atlantic City on like one of the boardwalk, uh, either one of the casinos or if not at the convention center. You. Always going to get something somewhere. Not really anymore. And uh, it's 
bought that book um, last month, the um, history of big city boxing, and you know, it's real bad because you know you want there to be more of a uh, a boom than a bust. Yeah. So hey, they're bringing something to the Borgata. I mean, I've never been to the Borgata, um, which is off the strip. It's like across the street. So I mean, I've never been there. I don't know what the parking's like. Uh, I don't. I don't know really anything about it. Um, I mean, I used to look at like the other convention center, or say, like even like um, the other year, it was at the Hard Rock, the old Taj Mahal, because you could walk, you know, down the boardwalk, hit a casino here, grab a bite to eat here, go into the casino for the fight. Um, or it's like when you're at the Borgata, you're like kind of isolated. That's like you know, you're there. It's you know, you can't really walk around Atlantic City at night. It's not a good place to be walking. Uh, outside of the boardwalk. Wow. Did you guys hear the other potential big fight news? Oh, Usyk. Usyk and Fury, right? Is that what you're talking about? No, I, I, that, that I did not hear, so that you're going to have to enlighten me. Yeah, I don't know how reliable it is. But it's on a website called marca.com, M-A-R-C-A.com, and it was in the Google Alerts, and it's claiming that uh, it's kind of sketchy as far as the reporting goes. It doesn't seem to come from an official source, but it's claiming that there's deal in the work, there's, there works, or at least talks going on to have Anthony Joshua uh, get paid step-aside money and also Dillian White to be able to be moved past and then have Usyk and Fury first, and then Joshua can face the winner of that. But um, you're talking you know, about I serious mean, step aside money. Bob Arum's going to have to show I'm, up. I'm not going to, you know, um, I'm not going to be against that. Mainly for the fact that you want the the best, and Usyk pretty much dominated um, Anthony Joshua. And Dillian White's a capable fighter, but he's been knocked out, and he's been beaten. Why not put two undefeated champs in there against each other? I mean, isn't that what you want? Yeah. I would think. Why not? The fight I'd want to see. I want to, I want, I want, I want to see the two best go at it. And, you know, thing, now the, last year when they were going to have... Um, Joshua and Fury before the judge voted in favor of third fight with Deontay Wilder, like they were looking at Saudi Arabia as being the landing spot. Hmm. And because Saudi Arabia was throwing like just a shit ton of money at him. Yeah, I think the same thing's going on now. Same yeah, thing's going on now. And like, the, the, the article I read said something I mean, about. I guess they have like less restrictions with the pandemic. Yeah, there's also some mention in the article I read about some other people getting involved in it who aren't even promoting either fighter. Like Frank Warren is supposedly like bumping his heads with these guys and or trying to get involved in, in setting up the Dubai thing or whatever they're doing somewhere in the Middle East. <clears throat> I think it's Dubai. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean... Um... It's, and and I think another part of the reason, like, you know, they've been doing some shows out there, and like, that's where they had Anthony Joshua fight, Andy Rubin fight, and, you know, you, you get, like, a lot of this big, you know, I guess, oil chic money thrown into it. Um, and you I guess can get over some of that there, fi- uh, pay the fighters the with, the, with the corona. <laughs> we need to find a chic. Yeah. Micro-less. But um, I guess they have less restrictions with the corona where places like the United States have where you got to require vaccinations and passes and all that. And I guess same thing over in Great Britain. But you tell me what your seller than Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury at Wembley Stadium. That would have sold Wembley out. Yeah. Two native yeah. British fighters that are champions fighting in Wembley? Yep. Yeah. Um, but the other news I heard was the p- potential... Canelo Alvarez Jamal Charlo fight for um Oh yeah. They've, been, my they've been putting that all across social media today. Uh and I don't know how much of that is Charlo trying to 
make that fight happen or boxing really wanting to make it happen but um, I think I think Canelo really is getting sold on the idea that he's beaten everybody worth beating in his division and he needs to move up he needs to start uh, eating the myoplex bowl again <laughs> putting on some weight <laughs> I don't know, uh, but you know, if if there's enough. Oops, sorry, drop the mic. Why don't you? Oh, Mike went in the trash. I'm trash talking now. <laughs> if there's enough social media demand and public outcry for it, I'm sure he could use a tune-up fight before he does make that step up. And uh, you know, if it's quieting the doubters. Just to show that he is ready. I mean, why not? You know what? It makes sense. See, here's where I see advantages. You know, you know, I, I'm smart about everything from all points of view, and I look at how something can benefit me. You know, it's a natural human instinct, right? So, a couple years ago, you know, right before mom, um, you know, when my dad was turning seventy, which was 2018, Canelo and um, Triple. Have the rematch. And I said, okay, I'm going to try to get tickets for this. And I logged on when they were having the pre sale. And the pre sale for the cheap, when I say cheap, I'm Dr. Evil air quoting again, mm -hmm. the cheap $300 seats. The pre sale was sold out by the time I got in the queue. Wow. I was 10 minutes before they went on sale. So I was like, well, I'm not spending 600 a ticket. You know, no, no, that ain't happening. But then. Ended up not fighting because I think that's when the tainted meat happened. They ended up fighting in September. Canelo got the win this time. So now, a couple months later, they're going to fight Jacobs. And I really like Danny Jacobs. My dad really likes Danny Jacobs. And I was like, yeah, Dad, we really should try to go to this one. And I said, and I was trying to talk myself out of it. But I was like, you know what? You, the tickets already went on sale. You're not going to be able to get them. And one day I'm sitting at work, I'm like, you know to look. I have to look. Oh, wait, they're on sale. Oh, they got plenty of seats available because Danny Jacobs doesn't sell like triple. Yeah. And I was like, Dad, they got seats. He's like, he's like, did you order your ticket? And I'm like, well, Dad, I need to know, am I ordering ticket? Mm -hmm. Ticket, zuh. He's like, zuh. I'm like, that would have been GF. I said, booked, let's go. And that's what we did. Um, so, um, I don't think, I like, I like the Kirby F. Um, he's going to have a large contingent of Russian fans. You're going to take a guy, um, you know, other fighters out there that are possible selling points, like when he was fighting the guy, um, Billy Joe Saunders. Billy Joe Saunders had a lot of his English fans. Those fans travel well. Yeah. Carlo, I don't. I think he would be like any Jacob, a fighter, a competent wild challenger, but I don't think he'll sell like Billy Joe Sunder, Baturbiev, Triple G, those guys. So that makes me I can get a ticket. Like I you said, I'm like, I'm, yeah. All right. Well, um,. We got a couple of MMA fights to talk about, and uh, that's pretty much it, I believe. That's not, not, not too many uh, big news stories this week. Um, but anyway, um, last weekend we had the Calvin Qatar Giga Chikadze free fight on TV, ESPN 3T, the 32 there. Uh, and. We just talked about the main event so far. The co-main event was one that you had to have to win the money on FanDuel. And uh, I had it on the one card that I had Qatar on. But those were my only two good picks, really. Uh, as far as, uh, you know, dominant performances. Um, but I did have Court McGee on the right card as well, I believe. He got a unanimous decision win. But, um, you know, with... FanDuel is all about the knockouts, and uh, the one guy I don't, I don't think anybody really could have predicted to be the very first guy on the card to do anything other than uh, get a decision 
It was uh, all the way in the sixth fight of the night. And uh, it was Vyacheslav Borshev over Dakota Bush. And uh, got a knockout from a punch to the body. Yeah, that's one of those ones where I was, uh, you know, in between feeds. <laughs> trying to reload the feed. Or no, uh, I think I was changing the channel or something. Because it was on free TV at that point. But yeah, I didn't even see that one. Come back to it, and bam, punch to the body, it's over. Uh, three minutes and 47 seconds into the first round there. So I did not have him on either of my two lineups. And by the way, I had a bad weekend in football, too. Even though I was smart enough to get uh, Giovanni Bernard on my one of my lineups, uh, I picked all the other running backs poorly. I had too much faith in the Patriots. And, uh, boy... Our Patriots and uh, Eagles got got wiped out this weekend, Tony. Oh well. What That's can you do? Um, yes, time to rebuild, right? <laughs> but yeah, ah, I had Jalen Hurts on one of my teams, and uh, he, he did not do. Oh, did not do that. And. Uh, yeah, it was a rough one, but uh, I figured if the Patriots were going to win, they were going to run, but uh, they couldn't run. They were getting wiped out. But anyway, I did have, was smart enough to have uh, Bourne, Kendrick Bourne. Uh, didn't have enough of the other big studs. Uh... Also on that card, Brandon Royval over Rogerio Bonferin by split decision. Uh, by the way, Jake Collier, like the other, was the other good one to have. I did get him on one of my lineups. He won by rear naked choke really quick. Two minutes and 26 seconds into the first round. I guess Chase really didn't have a chance to establish his game in that one. He's kind of more of a basic fighter, too. I was kind of surprised to see him in a co event like that. I know he's heavyweight, but um, no, he's kind of uh, he kind of reminds me of like a Forrest Griffin from back in the day. He just just throws a lot of one twos and somehow makes it work, but uh, just not at the level of some of the up and comers who are a little bit more well rounded, especially with uh, you know, heavyweight getting a submission is like unheard of, right? <laughs> Jake did it. Uh, Caitlin Chukagian was uh, expected to get the win, and she did, and uh, it was one of those lineups where the winner did not have to have a female fight, and that was the only female fight on the card, and because it ended by decision, uh, and there was not a lot of significant strikes, it was more of a tactical keeper distance fight for Chukagian, and, and Maya was a tough little girl, I mean, I shouldn't say little, but, uh, you know, short. <laughs> but it's a strong little, strong uh, competitor. You know, she she came in there and uh, and and got in range and was able to at least you know give Caitlin pause a couple times and uh, definitely didn't uh, didn't come to just get walked over. I mean, she tried. She tried to uh, do something different and turn the tide. But you know, Caitlin is just. Uh, very tall, very lanky, got tremendous reach, and she's very smart about when she engages. And you know, she ended up um, kind of leaving her chin open at a few few times. But uh, you know, she gets good instruction from her corner, and just all around had a great performance there. Just not enough to you know knock Jennifer's lights out. She wasn't letting that happen. <laughs> And then fifth fight tonight, Bill Algeo over Joe Anderson Brito. That was the one I picked wrong. Brito and Holmes before that. I, I think I picked both of those on the card. I needed to pick some winners. Uh, Jamie Pickett was one you had to have. He had a great win over Joseph Holmes uh, by this, the unanimous decision. He was one of the only guys you had to have who was a, a UD result. And as I said, Court McGee. UD over Ramiz Brahamaj. Brian Kelleher over Kevin Kroom. UD and TJ Brown in the first fight of the night over Charles Rosa. But it was one of the most boring undercards I've ever seen. <laughs> because everything went to decision. Uh, but anyway. 
Uh, obviously, this weekend we have a huge one. No pun intended. These guys are gigantic. Uh, Francis Ngannou versus Ciro Gagne. And uh, this one taps right into the fighter pay issue. Uh, Paythefighters.com plug here. Uh, Francis wants a boxing clause in his contract. Which gives me another perfect opportunity to ask Dana White, well, what the fuck ever happened to Zafa Boxing? <laughs> Thought you were going to do something with that. Um, except make t-shirts. <laughs> Made a lot of t-shirts, but <laughs> nothing real ever came out of it. And now it's coming back to bite him. Because, you know, back when he was talking about that, Nagano was really coming up. And he heard that little nugget and probably made him stick around a little bit longer. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, you know, he believed that bullshit that came out of Dana White's lying lips, but it didn't happen. So now it's a very interesting fight here because, you know, as, if you know anything about the UFC's contracts, they have a very uh, crazy... Uh, championship clauses. So, if this is going to be Nganu's last fight, kind of has to lose <laughs> uh, if he wants out of his contract. Yeah, good point. Because if he wins, then he's guaranteed for three more fights. The way I remember, it's it's been argued about, you know, and been put into the antitrust suits. Um, so I don't know. I mean, would he is would he be that pissed at the UFC they would purposely lose in that scenario? I doubt it. Uh, but it just brings an interesting dynamic to this thing because, I mean, what's he going to do if he wins and he doesn't want to fight for the promotion anymore? How's he going to sue his way out of that? Uh, will he sue his way out of that? That's a big question. Uh, yeah, because you remember Dana got on that rant and he says, well, hey, if he doesn't want to fight, he doesn't. Um, that's okay. Fly all remember that he, he just uh, he wants to fly all around the world. Hey, let him go do his thing. He wants to fight. We're here. Yeah. But that doesn't mean he's going to be re the, the issue. Right. And then on top of that, what do you do with the winner here? Um, with the next fight, I mean, they're talking about John Jones, but John Jones is no guarantee to come back unless you give him the right money. Uh. And the whole Francis and Ganu John Jones thing was, was, was would have already happened if John Jones agreed to the money, but uh, you know this is like a very embarrassing moment for Dana White going into what's supposed to be one of the biggest and best fights of the year. Uh, we don't know. We don't know how motivated one guy is, and we don't know if he really wants to stick around, win or lose. Uh, he might want to go box. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, what his real commitment is. And, and on top of that, you've got the one guy that's most logical to face the winner. He don't want to fight. For the biggest promotion in the world in MMA, it's it's just really bad look for the UFC. This is their biggest division, literally and figuratively. <laughs> so uh, it's very embarrassing for Dana White. And it's right after he's gotten so many jabs from... Um, the old uh, Jake Paul there. Although, I had to definitely give Dana White some credit the other day. This is rare moments in history. <laughs> that Tony probably saw. It was on my Facebook page. I had to repost a Dana White clip because he said something about the, the, uh, the whole situation with um, Joe Rogan getting uh, blacklisted and everything like that and their Google's trying to work around it and all these doctors you know, speaking out against one of his podcasts and uh, so Dana came out and actually made a lot of sense and, and he said you know now you can't even get these other treatments all you can get is the vaccine and like back when he took the stuff that Joe Rogan told him to take ivermectin and those sort of things zinc um when he started taking all that stuff you know it was easy to get now nobody will give it to you he said you know you can't even call somebody to get it um 
So, yeah, that was a good one. And then some asshole in the audience is like, are you a doctor? Are you a doctor? And he lit, he lit into that guy to the point where he, he gained really a lot of my respect. Because he said... Yeah, Rich, if you have a link, send me a link for that. I got to oh, see yeah, it if you still good. have it. And uh, so the, doc, the guy that said the thing about the doctor, he says, he says to him... He goes, I'm telling you, it's true. He goes, now, if I ask for some pain pills, I bet you I could get those real fucking quick. He goes, they hand those out like Tic Tacs. <laughs> and the clip ended. Uh, this, uh, see if you can find that. This, this is fabulous. I mean, well, what an idiot yeah. uh, that would even ask a question like that. What does he expect yeah. Are you say? a doctor? <laughs> God, God, that, uh, that's classic. That that is absolute classic. And you know, it's a shame that all those doctors that are complaining don't want to go on Rogan's. Yeah, case. yeah. I mean, they've got ninety nine percent of the media. But I can't watch the mainstream news anymore. The first ten minutes, oh, yeah. get back, get back, and they've right. got they have they can't handle any dissenting voices, and yet they still can't convince some people. And I think Rogan would have them on, and they could just. No, no, we got to get him canceled. We don't like what he says. Sickening. Yeah. Well, you know, the press conference yesterday is evidence enough that our fearless leader is uh, <laughs> not really up to snuff. He's really not impressive. Uh, he doesn't strike the fear in anybody. And uh, unfortunately, he's probably the easiest guy to pull one over on. And I think Putin's going to do it. He's he's really getting close. So, yeah. Fucking wonder what's going to happen with that. But anyway, yeah. Everybody's worried about inflation. Something else is going to hit the fan behind the scenes. That's probably the most likely thing to explode right now. Sad. Sad but true. But anyway, um... In addition to Gagne versus Nganu, we have another, a third go-around title fight between Brandon Moreno and Davison Figueredo. Uh, but uh, first, we got to put the psychic hat on you, Tom. And uh, who, who do you think that is going to win that fight? If you know you put all the side issues aside, uh, Gagne versus Nganu. Well, even before you uh, were. You reframed this so eloquently, so brilliantly, <laughs> about the dilemma. Uh, I was slightly leaning toward God. I mean, it's it's it, it's it's almost impossible to pick. You know, uh, the guy was the dog in this fight. Did that yeah, slightly. Um, and I would have to think that God that the intimidation factor is not going to be that big. And I think that Gon will have the format. Now, I could be wrong in the first 30 seconds, but I'm leaning toward that. But this, what you said, really. Yeah. Because I, I just can't see Francis. He's the company man. Holding back. Because there's, <laughs> there's a lot of bad blood here. With, yeah. uh, not Gon, but, but the trainer. Because I've been watching these embedded yeah. and uh, some of the press conferences. And there's real bad blood between Nagamo and that trainer. Hmm. And uh, so I I think that that he's going to be going out to take his head off, and then the chips will fall where they may. And uh, we'll see if, if if Dana would want to hold on to him again. I haven't even I didn't know that if he wins, but I thought it was just he was down to one more fight, and that's it. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works if you're at the end of your contract wins. and then you accept a title shot. You know whether that means like you have to defend it three times if you win it. Like. Well, yeah, and I mean, if Nagamo, if Nagamo were serious, he wouldn't have even, it just doesn't make sense that he put himself in, yeah. in the out of position. I mean, uh -huh. just relinquish the belt, and then, you, and Tyson Fury wants to fight him with MMA clubs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> showed up. With MMA clubs. It <laughs> reminds me, uh, Tyson Fury, what a maniac. What's his name there? Uh. Uh, Junior Dos Santos is about to make his triad debut, by the way. Triad Combat. I don't know when that is, but I saw that today. Oh, okay. So he's going to be doing that. Uh, with Speaking the of that, we... we half we, MMA we gloves. got to get Mr. Wheelock back on here. Oh, definitely. Definitely. That's going to be in the works. 
I bet you he would love the idea of, uh, f you know, paythefighters.com. Uh, we, we really got to be in the partnership making stage and, and make that go viral because um, there's a million ways we could use to uh, generate some interest and, and get these guys paid better. One of, the, one of the best things I was thinking about just today in the UFC is actually got a story out about something called Dapper Labs. Um, they're doing a series of NFTs. Uh, and they're going to include UFC fighter videos and stills and everything like that. It's probably one of those deals like I talked about a few weeks ago that the UFC does all the time and doesn't pay the fighters anything from, you know. But this is why they get their lifetime rights in some of these ridiculous contracts. <clears throat> um, but I was thinking more like a legend series, right? And we get some of these artists, and I know a very very talented artist who i convinced personally to get into the nft space and now he's selling his own uh and he knew nothing about blockchain or anything like that until i kind of got in his ear about it on facebook and, and i grew up with this kid i you know went to elementary school with him uh so very very tight friend and he knows how to make the nfts himself uh brilliantly brilliantly designed uh, pictures and paintings and stuff like that that he makes into NFTs. So, um, you know, you take some of these guys in MMA and boxing who are really struggling, you know, having tough times making ends meet, and the UFC doesn't have them under contract anymore if they're an MMA fighter or, you know, they're not dealing with a promoter who's taking care of them. Uh, they don't have a cushy job like, you know, Chuck Liddell used to have with the UFC <laughs> before they threw them out. You know, what do you do with those guys? Um, you, if you could make an NFT that people could buy and pay ridiculous money for, from just a picture of the guy as he is today in a fighting stance. I mean, you just think about it. It's easy money. Uh, and then you pay the, pay the artist a fair price for, you know, the actual sales. and Or you just put a percentage on it that goes to, goes to us. You know, because I came up with the idea and gave you the opportunity, you know, We'll, we'll put it on our platform. We'll get the attention on it. You know, so we get something for the fighters and the artist gets something for his work. <clears throat> and I've also talked to uh, Keisha out there in Vegas. Keisha Morrissey, our big-time political guest last year <laughs> around this. Actually, a couple, almost a couple years ago, I think now. When we had her on um, just before old Joe, Sleepy Joe, got a hold of this government. <laughs> But uh, she has a lot of connections oh, yeah. out there in Vegas, too, so she's, she's on board. And uh, I definitely think we can, uh, we can make a lot of strides here. And I'm, I'm very urgent about all my side projects and, you know, things that are connected to writing this year because I'm about to take over a friggin' mortgage for the first time in my life. $130,000 left on this house when it comes out of the uh, courts this year, so... I mean, I'm going to get a good chunk of change to have a buffer to be paying these mortgage payments, but, you know, i got to start banking <laughs> some money, you know. And uh, I'd also, at the same time, like to, whatever I do, actually help people, you know. So what better motivation than, you know, every time you get up to do some work on a project, you have the potential of, you know, changing someone's life for the better. And at the same time, you know, making a decent wage. I look at it like, you know, how does the, the Tunnel for Towers guy feel every day when he gets up, you know? Probably pretty good about himself. <laughs> and, he, you know, he probably clears a decent income, too. Uh, and obviously that's not the most important thing, but it is important. You can't starve yourself and, and, and be able to help people. <laughs> so, I'm excited about it. I think we can go really make a big difference with it and already you know twenty five hundred dollars for one glove tells you you know there's something special about this whole idea and you know obviously that scully's thing scully started it um and without his connections it probably never would have happened but um you know the sky is the real real limit the sky is the limit because there's just so much need and opportunity and it was funny too because when i was looking for stories on fighter pay issues, I found a guy named Jordan Scully, who was an autistic guy, 
over in the UK somewhere, and he had a GoFundMe page for him to go to a national tournament. And he plans to try to get into the UFC someday, too. Uh, but crazy, he said the same name. Makes you wonder, like, you know, do certain people just have fighting names or what? <laughs> Unreal. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah. Um, so one of the first things we're probably going to try to do is partnership, do a partnership with, like, a memorabilia company. And then I'm going to look into this NFT thing and see if we can, you know, ride that trend. Even though I know the, uh, the Bitcoin and Ethereum space is kind of hemorrhaging right now a little bit. It's uncertain times there. Kazakhstan supposedly is the big reason for that because Kazakhstan is dealing with so much unrest and I guess that's where they do a lot of the crypto mining. I don't know, some of this shit just doesn't make any sense, but I get that part of it, you know. I just don't know why. Why why is it Kaz why is all this shit going on there? Like you know, I could understand China, there's billions of people there. When they shut it down there, obviously there was a bubble burst. But Kazakhstan <laughs> of all places, I don't know. Anyway, uh, the home of Triple G. <laughs> the birthplace of Triple G. Um, the I horse have, milk man. Getting back to UFC 270, I have a tough time thinking Davison Figueredo has a shot in this one in the co-main event. So if if I had to predict, I'm going to go with Moreno again. Um, but Figueredo is yeah, I would conscious agree, but, but uh, uh, that this is it. You know, this is his chance. Yeah. So you never right. know when a guy's and, desperate. Uh, and uh, and our Brazilian friend is blaming what happened last time on the fact that he opened up uh, his own training facility in his hometown in Brazil, and he got too carried away, which uh, which could be true. Yeah. I don't know. I was got a story about it, but he's left Brazil and he's training with uh, uh, Henry Sedudo uh, in uh, Arizona. Oh boy! Who used to train with uh, Moreno about that? Oh, what, no. a, what a small world! It's going to teach him all the secrets. So it's—I uh, I, I will say this much: the UFC not only has great matchmaking, but boy, they know how to put these these countdowns and embeddeds together and give all these angles. Yeah. So, um, looking forward to it. It's kind of like we got both both ends of the of the we got two bookends. Yeah. Flyweights and heavyweights. <laughs> yeah, Moreno's exciting too. Like he's, I mean, he's just yes. he doesn't look like a fighter. Hence the nickname McLovin, you know, because he looks like the guy from Superbad. But uh, he's just, and he likes to play with Legos too. <laughs> he's really a big Lego fan, unbelievably. But uh, yeah, he just he's a very charismatic dude, and he's fun to root for, and, and he's just so durable, and it's just. A very surprising type of fighter too um, you just never know what he's going to bring to a fight and he's figured Davison Figueredo out twice and he's going to figure him out a third time and keep that belt I think he enjoys all the opportunities he's getting because he has the belt and he doesn't want to let that go he hasn't reached the Anderson Silva stage of championship <laughs> he just doesn't even want to deal with it anymore so I think he'll be fine uh, and then the 11th fight of the night, we got Michael Pereira, 26 and 11, fighting Andre Fialo, who is 14 and 3 at welterweight. I don't know about that one. Uh, did not pick it in my lineup. I've actually done a lineup for once during showtime. I have it. I have one lineup picked <laughs> for the first time in a long time, maybe ever. I don't know. We haven't been talking about FanDuel that much for that long on, on this because I just figured out I could do it there. But anyway, um, Cody Stammen in the 10th fight of the night, 19-4-1. I got his opponent, Saeed Nurmagomedov, because, you know, when a Nurmagomedov is fighting, you might as well pick him, especially when he's cheap. Um, but I got, uh, I got, um, even though he's got all the issues, uh, he was also cheap, Francis Ngannou. There's a couple bucks cheaper than, than Gagne. Uh, Rodolfo Vieira versus Wellington Terman. Uh, Vieira is 8 and 1. Terman is 17 and 5. I did not pick anybody in that one. 
Victor Henry, 21 and 5 at Bantamweight, fighting Rauni Barcelos, who's 16 and 2. That's another one I did not pick anybody from. Tony Gravely and Sa Simon Oliveira, who is 18 and 3. Gravely, 21 and 7. Uh, that's another one I did not pick, but I did pick Trevin Giles, 14 and 3, fighting uh, Michael Morales. And Morales has one fight in the Contender Series. He's 12 and 0, but he has one fight technically in the UFC. Not really. Trevin Giles has fought way better competition. Has had like three or four more formal UFC fights. So that's why I chose that one. And he was cheap. <laughs> And we got Vanessa Demopoulos. This is two, one of two female fights. She's fighting Silvana Gomez Juarez, who is ten and three. Demopoulos is six and four. Straw weight, like really light girls. So I did not pick that one. Uh, and then we got Matt Frevola versus Gennaro Valdez. Frevola is coming off two losses. He's eight and three with one draw. So I went with Gennaro Valdez on that one, who's undefeated at ten and zero. You know, he's kind of in that same position as Michael Morales with that record. I think he's also only got the one Dana White series, but he also comes with uh, a lot of knockouts, so that's very important. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I got him. And so I got Nganu, Moreno, Giles, Valdez. Who else? Of course, I can't see it here. The freaking Skype thing is blocking me. Okay. Valdez, uh, Kay Hansen. She's in the first fight of the night against uh, a girl named Jasuda Vicious. And Nurmagomedov is the roundup guy. Uh, the first fight of the night, Kay Hansen, 7 and 4 against Jasmine Jasuda Vicious. She's vicious, vicious, I guess. I Six and one is uh, her record. Kay Hansen is seven and four. And that's about it. That's the whole roundup. Got it nightly, nicely wrapped up in an hour piece here, just about. Alrighty. So let's hope I win some thousands of bucks this week. Maybe I'll buy my own glove to sell at auction for the next, the next fundraiser thing. There you go. It's fine. You see. want me to sign it for you? That'll be worth at least five. Yeah. There you go. We'll see. Um, another story I found out, I tried to contact the, um, the owner of the company. I haven't heard anything yet, but there's actually a, a Muhammad Ali robe uh, that's going up for sale and it was worn in the first fight that Ali had after changing his name from Cassius Clay and uh, it was worn up to the ring and signed by Ali so I believe that's going to be a big one in the marketplace so so that that, that would be the that, that would be the fight in uh uh, that would have been the rematch at Sonny Liston. Right, right. Yep. Uh, yeah, wow. Mm -hmm. May of 65. And then I, I remember Ali's voice right afterwards, because he had said before, I got a surprise. <laughs> 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 and if I told you the surprise, you would <laughs> Yeah. And uh, he was right. Well, he was right. The controversy remains to this day. So if you have a half a million dollars stashed away, you might have a chance of getting that. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know. Good luck. If I could spend it, I would, but yeah. I don't, so I'm a little short. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, it was good catching up, and uh, hopefully we, uh, we made the right picks tonight. <laughs> I don't know. It's well, still a toss-up to me. Gagne. My, my crystal ball. Gagne could win it. I mean, he's very technical. He's very defensive, like I used to be, like I used to like, but... Um, I don't know. I just think I think that uh, Francis Ngannou was more pissed off, and it's going to help him rather than hurt him in this situation. He's more pissed well, off, uh, and, and he's, we'll find he's out. hyped up. That's why amped. we fight. 
and he wants he's got something to prove that's the big thing Gagne is just a company guy he's doing his job you know he just doesn't have much like emotion period you know even when he wins he just, uh, just doesn't seem like he's just like you know right but I mean there. but that's his personality yeah. and it's worked for him so far yeah I don't know usually I would go with the technical guy but I kind of like uh Kind of like Ngannou to win this one. Well, it'll be fun. <laughs> we'll see. All right, adios for now. We'll catch up next week. All right, bud.